Let me tell you about ASCAP. ASCAP is America's only creator-first performing rights organization, or PRO. Their main job is to pay you royalties when songs you write are streamed, broadcast on radio or TV or played live. They're great at collecting royalties. In the most recent year, they collected more than $1.7 billion for ASCAP members. So, what makes ASCAP different? They're the only PRO in America that operates on a not-for-profit basis. The only one that was founded by music creators and is still governed by music creators and publishers. And they're in Washington all the time advocating for songwriters' rights in the age of AI. ASCAP represents over 1 million members, including this episode's guest, Lizzie McAlpine. If you are a songwriter or composer, ASCAP is where you belong. Writers can join for free. Learn more at ASCAP.com forward slash why join and follow at ASCAP on socials. Chartmetric is proud to sponsor the upcoming season of And The Writer Is as the go-to source for up-to-date global social streaming and audience data for artists and music industry professionals. Chartmetric strives to ensure everyone can have a successful career in music. They're easy to understand and powerful analytics on over 10 million artists and 100 million tracks will help answer all of your questions from tracking your stats to discovering new talents. Throughout this season, we'll be showcasing Chartmetric data to reveal insights about our featured artists. Plans start as low as... $10 $10 a month. Learn more and get started today at chartmetric.com. Welcome to And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. Today's rising star has gracefully navigated the crazy world that is viral fame. Influenced by jazz, folk, R&B, and everything in between, this guest is a young master at storytelling. After she posted her original releases and covers to SoundCloud, YouTube, and later TikTok, she blew the F up and has now become a leader in the modern singer-songwriter movement. A few albums and critically acclaimed collaborations later, this guest has proved that she belongs in the conversation for music's brightest star. All the way from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, this writer is one of my faves, and the writer is Lizzie McAlpine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so here's a true story. So I was listening to your album, and it was just that the it's the thing where I got a lot going on in my life. I got kids. Mm-hmm. It just was the album where it just kept going on, and every time I'd be in my car, it'd be the album that would just go on. I, I just hadn't changed the album. It's mm-hmm. I really enjoy the album, but my wife was really so surprised that I was listening to an album of somebody that is not, you know, it's like when you get to, you know, not, not that I'm that old, but like you tend to listen to a lot of music, you, you know, you grew up with or right. something. A lot of nostalgia. And here's like a new artist that I, I just kept listening to and listening to and listening to. So I genuinely am a fan and I'm happy you're here. Oh, thank so you so much. Let's start. Wow. <laughs> That said, uh, let's tell people a little bit of your story. Uh, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with it, but um, you were born. I was born, yes. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me about your childhood a little bit. I grew up outside of Philly. Um, okay. I always just say Philly because no one ever knows where I'm from, but I'm from this place called Lower Marion. Um, ah, like, uh, like, like Kobe, uh, Bryant. Kobe Bryant. Yeah, I went right. to his high school. The gym was uh-huh. named after him. I'm sure. Um, yeah, I grew up there. I did, I was heavily musical, like, from a very young age. I Why? Think, like, I don't know. It was fun. Were your, par- like, were your parents into it. music? No. My grandma had a piano at her okay. house, and she was taking guitar lessons. And Your like, grandma and, was taking guitar yeah, lessons? Yeah, she, like, wanted to be musical, you know? She yeah. tried her best. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> but... I, we were visiting her one time and I like picked up the guitar and started playing and she was like, well, I don't need to take lessons anymore. Like you're, you're better than me. And I've been taking lessons for like five years. Um, so yeah, I think she was the one that influenced me. How old were you at that point? Guitar I picked up later, but the piano I would, we were visiting her since I was like born. So, and you just would just, there's the piano. I'm going to that. I'm going to hit the thing. And I would just like be hitting notes before I knew how to play anything. And then I would teach myself songs and would you teach yourself you know 
pop songs or are you teaching yourself? I, I think the first song that I learned how to play on piano was um, Love Song by Sarah Bareilles. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, when, when did you decide to write songs? That happened in sixth grade. Right when I hit middle school, <laughs> there was a lot to write about. Apparently, <laughs> did you write? Was it like journals first, and then, you, or was it um, just naturally like I'm going to write songs? Did you want to be like someone? I I don't really remember like what the the goal behind writing songs was, or even why I wanted to write songs. I think I was just like, this is another way to express my creativity, and this is fun. Um, but I was just writing about like boys who didn't notice me and. Did all that people stuff. hear the music? Like, did you play it for people um, in school? The early, early stuff, not really. But as I started writing more and got like a little bit more confident, I was like putting some of them on like SoundCloud. And I think I would show them to like my friends. At six, in like sixth, seventh grade kind of thing? I think I started posting on SoundCloud in like maybe eighth grade. So the first two years I was writing, I was kind of just like keeping it more low key. I was like, I don't really know what I'm going to do with this stuff i'm just doing it for fun what's the first song you wrote that you remember it was called stuck in the moment i Uh, do remember it actually i don't remember i don't remember how it goes i don't remember how to play it but i have the lyrics written down in one of one of my notebooks you really don't remember it or you know i actually don't remember it. i wish i did now if i did i would be pulling out a voice memo right now and playing it for you but i don't remember unfortunately (laughs) um when how were you recording these songs when you said you posted them to soundcloud i was just doing it on my phone just on the voice memo app and then and then i found this like weird app where i could add like a harmony to like i could add another track it, but it wasn't garage band it was really it was on my phone it was very like old school i don't know what the app was called but yeah it was very rudimentary in the beginning <laughs> there's like a there's a an amazing uh naivete when you're that age where yeah. you feel like you know, at least I, what I'm really happy for for myself is that no one could ever hear any songs that I did at that age. <laughs> yeah. It's about the same age that I started writing. Like, I had years of making mistakes. Um, those songs, are they still available? The earliest songs, no, because I didn't put those anywhere. But um, I think, I don't know, a, lo- a while ago I went through my SoundCloud and like made it a lot of things private because... Yeah. <laughs> They should not be out in the world. No one should be able to listen to them. And I don't know if those were one of the things, but they probably should be. So maybe I should check after this. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you were in high school, you know, all this is junior high. You start posting stuff. In high school, uh, what was your musicality like? I was still writing more and just kind of doing it as often as possible to just get better. Um, and I was also, I was doing theater like heavily in theater I was very much a theater kid and I was doing choir I was in the regular choir and then I was in the choir that you had to audition for and then I was in an acapella group after school so like I was really in the music scene at my high school what uh what kind of musicals what's your favorite musical like just in general or sure, I don't know <laughs> uh, oh gosh I have so many um I love like deep cut musicals that no one like really knows if they're just like a casual music musical fan so there's this show called the wild party that i love there's this show called falsettos um next to normal dogfight like a lot of a lot of that that did you go to a lot of shows being in philly and kind of close to new york yeah every every year my grandma would take us to see a show for Mm -hmm. my sibling's birthday and so that started when i was like eight and the first show I saw was Beauty and the Beast. And oh. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. But I was also eight, so I was like terrified of the like the, the, roof, the roof scene. <laughs> I was crying. I remember I yeah. cried. But at, yeah, every year we go, sometimes multiple times a year we would go. And it was always so inspiring. I was like, I want to be doing that. When I was first starting to write out here, I, I would say Sondheim was one of my mm. influences. And, uh, and I remember a specific... Uh, well-known writer who just kind of like laughed at me and thought I was kidding and thought I was saying, I was like, no, no, you don't understand. Like Mm -hmm. when you're in a musical, if a musical is well-written, it's its own world. Yeah. And so you go into this world and it's usually well-crafted songs that have spent years of, 
of workshopping mm-hmm. to get to where it is. And you don't realize, like, if you listen to Bye Bye Birdie, you learn rockabilly. And if you go to Fiddler, you learn klezmer music. And mm-hmm. if you do, you know, if you do a Hamilton, you know hip hop or mm-hmm. backpack hip hop. If you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, whatever it is, most of the great musicals really are a moment. And, and it, like, gives you a, a, a deep dive into a genre that... Yeah that has been well vetted and really can be highly influential. Yeah. I mean, that definitely has some influence on my writing, like just in general, whether I was focusing on that or not, I think it was very self, uh, subconscious. Um, it, it just kind of seeped into my writing, I think just by being around Storytelling it. wise. Yeah, or? I think definitely. I mean, I can hear it. Other people have said that they hear that and I, I wasn't like, pl- planning on writing like that but it just kind of happened do you want to act yes definitely I mean to be honest like when I was younger I never was like I want to be a touring musician like I want to be singing my own songs I was like I want to be on Broadway yeah (laughs) that was like my dream as a as a kid and so yeah it's definitely something that I still think about all the time and would it have to be something you write no not at all I mean after this uh, album cycle is over. I'm like hard pivoting to, um, film, TV, theater, anything in that, anything in that world. I want to like live in other people's words just for a to little take bit a longer. break or yeah. Yeah. I need a break. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you've, it's so crazy. The last few years have just been wild. Yeah. It's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah. And just making this album was like so long and hard and it kind of took a little bit of the joy out of it for me and I want to find that again and I know that I I will find it again and I am starting to find yeah, it yeah. again but I think I need to like live a little bit before I can make more music um, it's, it's interesting this the um how you know if you're younger you you went to Berkeley which we'll get to but mm-hmm. like you know the the world just kind of opens up doors and you walk through them and you don't necessarily know which doors you're going to open it's yeah. like Maybe if I didn't, if had I gotten into Columbia or NYU for theater, maybe that's where I would have been instead yeah. of USC for music. And then, yeah. but I got into USC for music, so that became the that's career. That's literally path. exactly how it happened you know, for me. Like, it's not. It's not a. It's not a knock on any of it. It's like if you're yeah. a creative, you like doing. You know, like behind you are paintings that mm-hmm. one of the producers here painted. It's like you just don't yeah. know. Like people are, who are creative just do art, and you just. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people look at musicians as truth tellers. Mm. So there's actually like a better chance of you pivoting from there to to acting than the other way around. I th- yeah, <laughs> I think <laughs> actors are often perceived as professional liars, <laughs> even though they're supposed to be truth tellers. I think uh-huh. like nobody nobody's like, um, oh, I don't like Meryl Streep because I didn't like one of her movies, you know. But for yeah. some reason, people like identify a musician with their work and they're like yeah. oh i don't like taylor swift you're like you don't know taylor swift you just know her music you yeah. know what i mean no offense to taylor and we all like taylor don't get mad all right <laughs> so um we're we're at lower marion and you're uh you're doing like acapella stuff after school mm-hmm. so that's pretty funny um i was in socal vocals while sarah borellis nice. was over at uh oh, was wow. over at ucla so nice. uh acapella do or die there you go Yeah, i also did it in college oh you did yeah yeah, at Berkeley. Yeah. Wait. So, um, when you said you're doing music off, the, you know, junior high and high mm-hmm. school, and you start, are you, you know, you're you're going to tell your parents at some point, like I'm going to pursue <laughs> art. They probably knew it at that. I point. think it was just a given. Like I never really, maybe this was stupid of me, but I like never had a backup plan. I was never yeah. like, oh, I'm actually gonna like. Maybe if if music doesn't work, like I'll do this. I was I never was thinking about that, and maybe that was stupid, but but I was like I this is what I'm gonna do. Like I yeah. I knew it already. Like I I knew that this is what I was gonna do. And do everyone you have around siblings? me could one. What is it? what's what's the sibling? Their name is Emery. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> Does Emery do music? They're a dancer actually. Okay. And we're the only two like even relatively musical people in our immediate family. I think there were people on my dad's side of uh-huh. the family that were musical. Like I think his dad like played violin really well. Um, and I think my mom can carry a tune, but 
but she doesn't like singing because she's very shy. So I don't really know where it comes from, but we're the, we're the two musical people in the family. It just happens that that's just, that's just the way it works. Do you yeah. got, is, has Emery been in any videos or anything like that? In music videos. For you. No. Like, it's like... <laughs> no. But they actually did design. They're also, they also um, are an artist. Oh, okay. Um, and like visual artist. And they designed some of my merch actually for my last album. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So you go, uh, you go to Berkeley. Were you looking at other places? Yes. I was mostly looking at other places. I actually toured Berkeley and I was like, eh, it's not really for me. Um, but I was like, I'm going to apply anyway, just to see what happens. Um, but I applied to all other schools for acting. I was going to go for like contemporary theater, um, not musical theater because I was, I joined a Facebook group of like all the kids who were like applying to musical theater school. And I was like, okay, like, let me see the vibe. And immediately I was like, I can't go to school with these people for four years. Like mm-hmm. I can't. So I pivoted. Um, there's something that I, I always say about theater because it, in, it's like, if you want drama, go to the theater <laughs> and there's nothing more dramatic than <laughs> musical theater kids, especially in college too. And yeah, I, yeah, I, but I, I was like doing auditions. I did a bunch of pre-screens for all the schools. And um, then I got into Berkeley like before I even got that far in any of the auditions. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to go here. Because I think at that point I felt more confident in my music abilities because I've been doing it for longer. And I was, I just like felt that that was like the right path to take. Don't they at have that a musical point, theater department? They're connected to Boston Conservatory, which yeah, right. has the theater. Yeah, right. And while yeah. I was at Berkeley, I was like, I need to transfer. Like I, I, I made the wrong decision, but I didn't obviously. And then I ended up dropping out and it all worked out. But, <laughs> but I think that was the right thing to do. I mean, mm-hmm. it was what I did. So it was the right thing to do. It got me here. So, um, <clears throat> Putting out music at Berkeley is got i've got to be a different thing because everyone at berkeley feels like they're putting out some music is it competitive or is it supportive it didn't really feel competitive to me in my friend group and the circle that i was in um we all were like kind of collaborating so like the stuff that i was putting out i was working on with my friends and it felt like really fun and i was kind of just experimenting Mm -hmm. at that time in my music career and that's why the songs that i released at berkeley like they're not on streaming platforms anymore because it was just a i was just figuring myself out and and i don't think that that really represents who i am anymore but it was very fun and we were all having a great time together uh you wrote your first uh, your first studio album in spain is that right or what part of it most of it yeah did you record it there no we um So I worked with Philip Etherington, who was also at Berkeley when I was at Berkeley, and we recorded the whole album in his like tiny apartment in Boston Um, in between. Like, I think, oh my God, I haven't thought about this in so long, so I might get some details wrong, but I think we recorded the first single before I left, and then I went to Spain and I wrote like a bunch of new songs, and then I came back and we finished the whole album. Did you travel to Spain with a guitar or did you get a guitar yeah. there? Yes, I did. Um, did you did you immerse yourself into the Spanish culture or were you so obsessed <laughs> with writing music that you did that mostly? I mean, I, it, I was kind of miserable, if I'm being honest. Like I was doing, I was doing a minor there, like of like music tech, basically. So I was just not having fun in my classes. I was like, I don't want to be doing this. I had to learn how to use Pro Tools. And I was like, I don't care about this. And I don't know how to use this. And it doesn't make any sense to me. And Are I was you having, now glad that you know a little bit about it? Or you I still mean, don't care? I don't really care. And yeah, other yeah, people yeah, do it for me. And I, whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's the one thing where I'm like, I don't need yeah, to be in control. Because yeah. it doesn't make any sense to me. But yeah, I was doing that, all that stuff. And it was just not, the classes weren't fun. And then I like really didn't, I had like three friends and and I was also going through a breakup. It was just like a weird time in my life. And and it. I was, it was very lonely and isolating there. So I was writing a lot. I was yeah. just like in my room writing a lot. Yeah. It's interesting that like the, when you said the sixth grade thing, you're like, yeah, there's a lot to write about in sixth grade. And then you mentioned like the boys that like you didn't. And then you're like, wow, you know, here you are in Spain, like yeah. 10 years later and still like that draws the same sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. When things are going well, is it do you find things to write about? Um 
<laughs> it depends on it depends i think like so much of your stuff seems very autobiographical it is i mean i can't write so anything like, that hasn't has not happened to me yeah. um so it is all about what's happening in my life yeah. and i really have only written like sad songs basically to put it into a general category for like my whole life career basically it's just like what has felt the best to me it's catharsis too yeah when you're writing songs and you're it's like it's hard to explain to people who don't get it that you're like no no no, i need to write for sanity and it becomes like a way to in a way edit down an emotion to three minutes yeah it's like therapy basically um processing things in real time you have some co-writes, but obviously most of it's stuff you write by yourself. Why um, do you enjoy writing with other people? Again, it depends. Sometimes. Um, I think when I first moved here specifically, I was just like thrown into a bunch of co-writing sessions because yeah. that's just like how it goes do. here. And I really did not like them. A lot of them. Um but there are a few co-writing sessions and people that I've worked with that have just made it feel so easy and open. And those are the people that I like writing with. And when I find someone like that, I don't do write co-writing sessions like really any anymore at all. Um, because I just like, I, I'm very specific about who I want to write with. And if I, I'll only write with someone if I like really admire their work or them as a person or i want to i feel like we could create something really special and i i'm grateful that i'm not in a position anymore where i have to be like going out and doing co-writing sessions with random people that i've never met before you know when you you graduated at a really interesting time and it's like obviously or not graduate yeah i did not graduate (laughs) you leave you leave berkeley at an interesting time yes things start taking off career-wise and whatnot but it's also like right before, like right before COVID, right? Um, yeah, I left the day. So yeah, the day that they announced that Berkeley was going to be online, my dad also passed away the same day. Oh wow! And um, and then yeah, COVID was happening, and then I left. I went home and never went back. And then it was, and I did the rest of. You have some co-writes, but obviously most of it's stuff you write by yourself why um do you enjoy writing with other people again it depends sometimes um i think when i first moved here specifically i was just like thrown into a bunch of co-writing sessions because that's just like how it goes here and i really did not like them a lot of them um but there are a few co-writing sessions and people that I've worked with that have just made it feel so easy and open and those are the people that I like writing with and when I find someone like that I don't do write co-writing sessions like really any anymore at all um because I just like I, I'm very specific about who I want to write with and if I I'll only write with someone if I like really admire their work or them as a person or i want to i feel like we could create something really special and i i'm grateful that i'm not in a position anymore where i have to be like going out and doing co-writing sessions with random people that i've never met before you know when you you graduated at a really interesting time and it's like obviously or not graduate yeah i did not graduate (laughs) you leave you leave berkeley at an interesting time yes things start taking off career-wise and whatnot but it's also like right before, like right before COVID, right? Um, yeah, I left the day. So yeah, the day that they announced that Berkeley was going to be online, my dad also passed away the same day. Oh wow! And um, and then yeah, COVID was happening, and then I left. I went home and never went back. And then it was, and I did the rest of the semester online. But it was like. And then also my career was, I was starting to post covers on Instagram and that was like really doing something for my career apparently. And all those things at the same time were like so insane to try to like process and balance and like the juxtaposition of the feelings in that moment was like so 
so wild. Have you processed any of that? I think I think so. I think I'm start. I mean, I've it's a, it's a lifelong thing. I think, but yeah, I mean, I'm in therapy every week. Vanessa, shout out to Vanessa. Yeah, shout out to Vanessa. <laughs> It's so weird. I'm. I'm. I feel like right now is the first time where I'm starting to realize what the what the pandemic was. Mm-hmm. And but it, you know, that timing of three or four things all at once for you is just a wild, yeah, transition. Yeah, <laughs> it was crazy. Did you write yourself out of that? You know, it's like here. Here, it's like I, I, I'm not going back to school. My father passed away. I can't go back to school. Mm-hmm. Everybody shut down. I could see like doing nothing or I could see like diving all the way in heavy on writing. I don't really remember if I was writing that much, but I was like finishing my first album at the time. Um, We like weren't quite finished when COVID happened. So we still had like some remote stuff to do. This was was stuff that you were recording while you were before you were at Berkeley. I guess I don't really know the business, (laughs) the business of I I thought you were originally distributed through like a wall. Yes, and stuff, I right? was. Yeah. So that you were like self making this album. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So when you're saying we were doing this album, me and Philip, right? Yeah. So you're finishing the album that you wrote half of in Spain. Yeah. Then all this shit goes down. Yeah. And then you have to finish the album. Yeah, I think I remember like the last song that we were recording. I like recorded in my bathroom at home, like after covid had happened and then i just like sent the stems to philip which song was that where do i go so you know how to re- you know how to record yeah i know how to just... use logic i mean when i was recording my i mean the soundcloud phase of my life which i'm not really in anymore but when i was like deep in it yeah. in like middle school high school i taught myself how to use garage band and then i found logic and then that was just like a natural step so i, I know how to use logic yeah. um because of that so it was easy. I wasn't like helpless. <laughs> um, you know, you finished the album and how soon after that does it, you know, how do you get from, I finish an album, the world's been shut down to how do you get to a wall? How do you get to your team? How do you develop, like who developed a team in the middle of COVID? How well, did that happen? Yeah. So I, we finished the album like early summer, I think, or I don't know. It came out in August and. And when it came out, it's through AWOL at this time. So you. Yeah, but it was not like, I I wasn't like signed to AWOL. It was like, you went to the AWOL website and like signed up myself. Like I did it myself. And then I like put in all the information and they just distributed it. Like I wasn't working with AWOL. I was just like, this is a way to put the music out. Fascinating. Um, but I had a manager at that point because I had posted an Instagram video while I was in Spain that like went, did pretty well. And he saw it and he at the time managed like Bruno Major and Eloise and I was fans of both of them. And he emailed me and he was like, I'd love to like get like catch up. And at the time I had a manager from Berkeley, so it wasn't like a real manager. And um, after that didn't work out, then... Sam and I started working together and um so at at the time the album was coming out he he was my manager so I wasn't like alone doing this which would have been so scary and I would not have known what to do at all but yeah so I had Sam and then I had just AWOL the distributor well this you know you start releasing songs and they you know when you have I, I know a lot of people release songs where it gets you know on on these distribution channels that have 10,000 streams, you know, 50,000 streams, mm-hmm. and maybe they have like a couple thousand monthly listeners, but they don't have like millions of streams. And right off the bat, when you first release stuff with them, it seems like, I guess I don't know the timing of it, but it seems like it, it reacted pretty quickly. How did people discover? I don't really remember. I, I do save like all of my Spotify for artists, um, like yearly uh-huh. wrapped yeah. Every year, and I remember. Here, let me, actually, let me see if I can find it. Because I have the first one from when I put out my first album, like a while ago. It's it's just pretty crazy. You've t- tens of millions of streams on yeah. this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it definitely didn't. It took. It took. It was but not that, overnight. You know, some of that's retro. Definitely. Um, but yeah, so in 2018, I had 
only released like a little album from like when I that I made in high school. It's not I took it off of streaming platforms. Like it's I did not like it. I had I had um seven thousand streams and four hundred and nineteen fans. And then the next year after I don't know what this was after because I I think I put out the album in 2020 but somehow oh I think it was just the singles like apple pie pancakes for dinner I think like did something for me um I had 34,000 listeners and 110,000 streams I think that might have been from pancakes for dinner but I don't really remember this is kind of all a blur um and then in 2020 after I put the album out, I had 2.3 million listeners and 14.7 million streams. Yeah, crazy. Which is like, what the heck? So fast. That's insane, actually. I don't like really look at this stuff anymore. Dang. Yeah, it's hard It's hard to fathom what that that those numbers are, too. Yeah. When you think that that would be, you know, like the sixth largest city in the United <laughs> States of everybody, if everybody there was following you. Yeah, that's and, wild. And like when you think, you know, the 14 million streams or whatever. Yeah. And that's at that point. Now you have, you know, it's like, I think Ceilings has like almost half a billion or yeah. half a billion or more. It's getting close, it's I like, think. <laughs> that's like everybody in the United States choosing to <laughs> listen to it. It's more than that. You know, it's like everybody yeah. in North America choosing to listen Jesus. to your song. It's hard to fathom that. Yeah. Um, when after the first album comes out and you mm-hmm. see those numbers moving, did you start feeling, were you starting to feel pressure or was it exciting? I don't think that I have ever felt pressure from like anyone except for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, even then, like, I don't, I'm not the kind of person that's going to like be like, okay, I made this album this way. Now I have to make something else that's exactly like this because that's what people like. Like that will never be me <laughs> um, because I'm going to make what I what I want to make in the moment and people are going to have to deal with it. Yeah. And so I think after the first album came out, I was like, okay, this was really cool. I want to start working on my second project. And I was kind of thinking that it would be going in a more like indie direction. Honestly, I thought that Five Seconds Flat would be like closer to this last album that I put out, but it ended up being more experimental and more pop focused. And that was fun at the time. I was just really an experiment. I think that um, the sound that I am closest to, like actually authentically is the first album and the third album that I just put out. But the second album was kind of just like an experiment and it was great and it was fun and I had a lot of fun making it and I do really like it. Um, But yeah, it was just, I was kind of just like experimenting. And then after that album started doing really well because of ceilings, that's when I like kind of started to be like, okay, well maybe I need to make something like this because like this is what people respond to apparently. But that was a fleeting thought. And then I was like, I don't care. (laughs) I'm going to do whatever I want to do. It's also really, really hard to write the same song twice and have it still be unique. Yeah, and also and, it's like yeah. I, I'm always at a different point in my life when I'm making all these albums. I've been at different periods of my life and I've had different, I've learned different things in between making all these albums. So obviously I'm going to be a different person when I'm making all of them. And it just, yeah, it just feels like. If you're a songwriter or composer, you have to join a performing rights organization, or PRO. Performance royalties are an essential part of your income, if not your only income. ASCAP is America's first PRO, and the only one that operates on a not-for-profit basis, which means the money they collect goes to their songwriters, composers, and music publishers. And ASCAP supports you in a lot of different ways, even beyond the royalties. They run workshops and networking events for creators, like the annual ASCAP Experience. Check it out at ASCAPExperience.com. They got tons of resources on their website to help you learn about the music industry. They've even got a wellness program. I really respect that ASCAP is a true democracy. ASCAP members elect their board of directors, and the board is made up of music writers and publishers. They've got 
over 1 million writers, including this episode's guest, Lizzie McAlpine. Writers can join for free. Learn more at ASCAP.com forward slash why join and follow at ASCAP on socials. Our good friends at Chartmetric have all the data you need to power your music career, from playlist placements to stream counts to follower demographics and many more. It's never been easier to understand how your artists fit in the music industry and how they can grow. Chartmetric does the work for you, providing actionable insights and visuals on their up-to-date global data that covers over 10 million artists and 100 million songs. So there's no math required. Use it to find out things about your favorite artists and any of the artists and writers on this podcast. Plans start as low as $10 a month. Learn more and get started today at chartmetric.com. Why did this album, why was this so hard to make? (laughs) so many things just like popped up at every like there were so many obstacles that I had to jump over or go around and like what like uh, let me think about from the beginning Let, let me go through the timeline well I started making this record like pretty soon after five seconds black came out I think it was like maybe July of of 2022 Mm -hmm. and or yeah 2022 i don't know time is really weird i don't like know any timing anymore so i could be like so off i know we started it in july and i was i started it with philip again who Mm -hmm. i had done my first two albums with and we did a couple sessions and then months went by and it was kind of like okay i don't think that this is really going to be working out just because of the timing that we are both at in our lives. Like it doesn't feel like Hmm, there's the time for this right now. Um, and he was like, that's yeah. Yeah. I don't really like have the space for this right now. And I was like, that's fine. So then I pivoted. That was in like September. And then there were a lot of months in between like all of these changes where like I was either touring or like just waiting for some, someone to come along and, and after I, Philip and I stopped working together, um, I found Ryan who was friends with Philip. We were all friends before. And he was like, I can kind of like, we can start making this album. And so we did that. And then we we're working on that for like nine months. And then that wasn't really feeling like authentic to me. Like we were almost done with the album. And then I just like, just something was just not right and not clicking in the music for me and I didn't know what it was and it didn't feel like the album that I was supposed to make yet and so I kind of pivoted again and then I found this band that I ended up working with um and we were re-recorded most of the album with them we kept some of the stuff that Ryan and I did because it was really good um but we it was a very hard process. Like those two weeks were probably the hardest part of this entire thing because I had a, 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 I had these songs, these versions of these songs that I've been listening to for so long now that Ryan and I did together. And I was like, I want to change them. But then some of them, I was like, well, I, I kind of like them. And it was like hard to balance. Like I was feeling guilty. I was like, well, we came here to redo these songs and now I like the originals, like on some of them. And, It was a lot of like trust the process and I'm like not good at that. And also we were just doing it in a completely different way than I'd ever made an album before. Like we were tracking everything in the room together at the same time. We were not mixing as we went. Like normally Philip and I would be like producing and mixing. So I would leave with a finished bounce that like sounded really good. And that was not the case with the band. We were just like recording and then we would come in the next day and listen to it back. And I'd be like, Oh my God, I know exactly what I know should happen, but I can't make it happen yet because we're still like in the middle of it. So it was really like control, letting go. I was like, I need to trust the process and trust that it will sound good. And it did. But then like after that, I switched management again, which was like a whole thing. And then, and then 
like we had to mix the album and we were like running up against the deadline and we did not make the deadline (laughs) (laughs) and we had one mixer and then we pivoted to another mixer and then he was like in another country for a week and so it was just like there were it just felt like so many things were stacked against me in the making of this album but I just kind of I had to just trust that it would work out and it did and I'm really so happy with the way that it turned out and I think that it all yeah, happened. It literally made you older. Literally. <laughs> it aged me. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I think it all happened for the right re- Like, it was all happening for Would a you reason. Would do the next album, now that you've seen the result of the, the newest way of doing mm-hmm. it, would you consider recording the next album like you did this most recent album, or would you want to go back? I don't. I think I ever really want to go back. I yeah. think... Just you'll, or or will you feel more comfortable trusting the process, knowing that in the end it works out? I think so. Yeah, I think the second time yeah, around yeah. would be would be easier on on me mentally. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think if I was gonna make another album, it would be similar to that process that we just did because it like this music that I made is just it just feels like the music that I was always meant to make and the way that I was always meant to make it in collaboration with other people and. Um, the old process just didn't really feel that like that. I got, I'm pretty in tune with how albums are made, and I don't think that I I would not have known that they were done in totally different fashion. You know, <laughs> well, it just it was, so I mean, it, I think that's what's interesting is like <clears throat> to you it it means something, but to the rest of the world it doesn't like sound like that because you sound like you mm-hmm. telling your you know what I mean like that's who you're focused on. Even when you're like a discerning individual in the business, you're still not listening to it and being like, man, this sounds like they went back and forth with different techniques and different kinds of... Oh, like, well, yeah, I mean... You don't hear any of that. That, that I was struggle. worried about that. I was like, it needs to sound cohesive. Yeah. Um, it does because you're on it. Yeah, and that's what everyone around me was saying. They were like, it's you, so it's going to. During these last you know, five years in the business, are you... Um, do you have any social life? Um... I'm finding it, honestly. I don't know. It's hard. I also just like went through a breakup and I was kind of like just, I didn't have a life before we started dating and then I was just like integrated into his life. And now I'm like, I need, I mean, that's the reason we broke up. I was like, I I need to know that I can do, I need to know myself. I need to know that I can have a life on my own and I want that and I'm and I miss that even though I like don't really think I've ever had a now I mean now I'm like I have a stable home I like I'm not moving from apartment to apartment anymore I have like people here and I was like do you I really like need California to... now having... I do yeah it was lonely and isolating at first because I didn't have a community and right. I, I was jumping from apartment to apartment but now I feel like I found people I found this band um I found Molly, my manager, and um, it just feels like way better now. And I'm starting to kind of rebuild my my life, yeah, which, yeah. which feels really fun. I'm sure. Um, you, you've had so many amazing, uh, going back to music, collaborations outside, um, outside of your albums. And what's interesting is like when I think of collaborations five years ago, 10 years ago, it's like, it'd be David Guetta featuring Lizzie <laughs> McAlpine. It, it wouldn't be like, there's not like, you know, and it, it, then again, if it were the eighties, it would be straight up like a duet. Yeah. Now it's like featuring and all this stuff, but your, your relationships are amazing. I mean, <laughs> Jacob Collier and Phineas mm-hmm. who's been on this podcast and Noah who's been on this podcast mm-hmm. and like, you know, it's just amazing the people that Niall, who we're friends with, like you've been able to be, you know, connected to all these people. Are they reaching out to you, or is uh, it that, yeah. or is there like this giant text chain of cool, <laughs> cool musicians where it's like, who wants in? Definitely not that. That'd um, be so rad. That would be sick. Just like a hundred like of the <laughs> sickest artists just be like, I got this song. Who wants on? It's like I'm in. That's hilarious, but no. Um, it was kind of it, di- Jacob Collier and Phineas were different because, I mean, Phineas was different. I reached out to him yeah. on Instagram and I was like, I have this song. Do you want to yeah. like be on it? And he was like, sure. 
Yeah. Actually, he was like, "Fuck yeah!" That's what he said. Um, he's the he's he's the best. He's, he's so great, like yeah. literally like very talented musician and very smart individual. Yeah. He's a lot of the things. Yeah, and he really yeah. like championed for me when when I mean he was yeah. on my second album before Ceilings blew up, and he was like really championing championing me um, in my like early stages of my career, and I just I'm very grateful. Um, How did the Jacob Collier one come up? I think I covered one of his songs on Instagram during it's the hard, pandemic. It's a hard song to cover, whatever it was, if it's his. Yeah, it was, I mean. It's like seven, eight, and then it's in seven, 14. <laughs> no, no, like, I picked, I picked an easier forward. one. I couldn't do a harder one. But yeah, and then we became friends. And then um, I just wanted his harmonies on my song. Yeah. And he said yes. How about the Noah? Um, I think Noah reached out to my team, actually, I think. So rad. Yeah. Um, what's next? Uh, finishing this tour uh -huh. and then pivoting. <laughs> what do you do for, if, if there's a, a sophomore at Berkeley who has been writing songs through high school and is at Berkeley and has something going on, what's advice you give for somebody that could actually break into the business in 2024? <sighs> I don't know about like, I mean, I think it was a little bit different, not that, not by much, but just the online culture, I think was a little bit different, like deep in the pandemic when I was kind of breaking out of, I was in my career, but I think like, I think it's just a little bit more ruthless now <laughs> than what I remember it being. Um, but honestly, like, I say all the time, just be yourself. And I think yeah, it's man. so cliche that's and it's it. so, but it's like really the only thing that matters because that's what makes you unique and that's what makes you you and no one else is going to be like you. And if you try to be like anyone else, it's just, it's not going to, it's going to fall flat because you're not being yourself and you're not being authentic. I think authenticity is like the most important thing that you can ever do if you want to have a career in music. I think one of the hard parts or I mean, I mean, in anything, anything, anything. anything but, <laughs> but, but one of the hard parts is, you know, your authentic self is exciting to other humans. Yeah. And it wasn't something you could have predicted mm -hmm. that how, how much people liked your authentic self. Yeah. I think the hard part is that not everybody's authentic self will put them in the same seat that you're currently <laughs> in. And that's the part that I think is, is a tough truth, but shouldn't mean that you shouldn't pursue that honesty well, i think it's everyone like, has their own path and everyone if, yes if you are authentic to yourself you will find the path that's yeah. right for you yeah no doubt i think all right we're going to the next segment which is a five for five i'm gonna just list five things and tell me what comes off the top of your head okay we're gonna go with philly a home Okay. Is this like a word association game? It, like, can, what's it happening? can be. <laughs> okay. it, there really aren't do rules. Do you want one nobody... word? Do you want like a story? Do you, you want know, a we've sentence? Had we've had people do like diatribes. And we've had people say one word. So really there are no okay. rules. But we'll, we'll go with Berkeley. <laughs> I'm we'll, not we'll, good at word association We're going to do Berkeley so. next. Okay. Um, uh, community. We'll go with ceilings. Uh, um... Plaster. I don't know. It's the next lyric. <laughs> That's so literal. I don't know. Um, uh, your mom? Strong. Okay. I don't know. This is this weird. <laughs> um, and we'll go with older. Um, when I think of older, I mean, I think it's the core of the album. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing the podcast. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks no, for I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I literally like, I was excited when this album came out because there's a really cool movement going on. And, and when my friends say there's, you know, when, when you hear people say that there's not any good music out, one, it makes you sound old as shit. <laughs> so like put in some effort. Number two is like, they're totally wrong. Mm. This is an incredible era of music in yeah. all, in all genres. But there's like specifically this, what I like about what, you know, the U's and the Noah's that are going on right now is like the choruses are singable 
and there it's not just this uh diary for the sake of just like saying just being so wordy for being wordy i think they both like i think you have this grasp on on composition that is really good even if you're not listening to the meaning of the lyrics which i think is really important to get someone to listen to the meaning of the lyrics Mm, yeah you know and you're just doing it really well and i'm just excited that you're doing the thing that you're doing and i i hope that you don't take a break for too long oh i'm already writing i'm already writing i kind of think you're full of shit too no, I definitely am not, but I No, I think you're have... gonna do a piv- I think you're gonna do those things and I think that there's no way well, I'm that gonna come somebody, back. There's no but there's nobody nobody <laughs> has been writing music since they were in sixth grade <laughs> and then as you know, is like I, I can stop I, I there are people who can I know. Y- I mean I was just area. so burnt out. I just need um some new life Take, experiences. Yes. Which I'm getting currently yes. and I'm writing about them, so yeah, yeah, you're never, you're never, you're, you're, you can hard pivot by, it is, is like adding to what you're currently doing. And maybe hard yeah. pivot means you're not on tour next year, but it definitely, yeah. uh, there's no way that you're in like, I know we're just, it meeting, won't be too but long, no but you, you, I'm doing other things first. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Well, when you're done, then you'll, you'll come back yeah. and we'll do this next one. Great. All right. Thanks. There you go. <laughs> 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 <laughs>